Hey guys and welcome back to another episode of the data series. Today we're going to be building a logistic regression model that will predict if it will rain tomorrow in a given location in Australia. So before this project begins I would just like to apologize for not uploading recently. The initial plan was to upload once per week so I apologize for that. So previously we were just looking at weather data related to Albury but now we have much more data with new locations such as Newcastle, Norfolk Island and Sydney. And we're also dealing now with categorical data. For example, with this wind gust direction column, we have west, northeast, and so on and so forth. So how do we deal with categorical data? I hope to explain in the pre-processing steps of this project. So without further ado, let's begin. So here I've made a new Jupyter notebook and I've renamed it to Logistic Regression Project 2. And I've also imported a few libraries. So warnings, which will be used to ignore any annoying warnings that pop up in our notebook. Also pandas, which will be used for data manipulation and also to read our data into Python. And numpy, which will be used for any mathematical operations. So to ignore all warnings, we can use the following code, where we just do warnings.filterwarnings and then ignore. So that's used really just for convenience, just to ensure that no annoying warnings pop up. So our next step is now to read our data into Python. And for that, we can do the following code. So we'll store the data in the variable df that we do pd.read underscore csv. We then find the location of our data and copy the file path. And then now we'll just add the name of the file, which is weatherors.csv. We'll just run this to make sure everything is loaded. Okay, good. I just want to get an idea of how many rows and columns we have in our data. And for that, we can do print size of weather data and then we'll do comma df.shape if we run this now we can see that we have around 142,000 rows of data and 24 columns to display the first few rows of our data we can do df.head if we run this now there we go so this gives us a good idea of what our data looks like and what columns we're dealing with so we're now going to explore our data a little bit and a good method we can use is df.describe. We run this, we're given some statistics of each of our columns. So this count refers to the number of rows that contain that column's data. So we know here that we have 142,193 rows of data and 141,556 out of you know, that number of rows contain minimum temperature. 141,871 contain maximum temperature and so on and so forth. We're also given the mean of each column, the standard deviation, uh, the relevant quartiles and the minimum and maximum. So in this episode, we're going to be removing all columns that contain a significant amount of missing data as, they, as these columns may not be as useful for predicting if it will rain tomorrow. So to identify these columns, we can do df.counts. Uh, which will give us all of our count statistics in one big column like this. And then we can do dot sort underscore values, which will put them all in ascending order. So we see here that Sunshine contains the most amount of missing data, with only 74,377 rows containing Sunshine, and then followed by Evaporation, Cloud 3 p.m., and Cloud 9 a.m., and so on. So to remove columns from our data set, we can use the following code. So here I've done df equals df.drop, then we identify the columns we wish to drop. So here we're removing sunshine, evaporation, cloud 3 p.m. and cloud 9 a.m. being the four columns that contain the most amount of missing data. And we're also removing risk mm, since risk mm gives the amount of next day rainfall in millimeters. So this is giving us information as to whether it will rain tomorrow, which we're not really supposed to know. And this is a concept called data leakage. And also we'll be removing dates. We do axis equals to one to identify that we are removing columns. We will do axis equals to zero if it was for rows. And lastly, let's now do df.shape to display the new shape of our data frame. So if we run this here, we see here now that the number of rows still remain the same as before of 142,193. We have now removed a total of six columns, giving us now only 18. So for our next pre-processing step, we're going to be removing all rows of data that contain missing values or NA. 
And we can afford to do this because we already have quite a significant amount of data. To do so, we can do df equals df.drop na. And then we'll display the new shape of our data frame by doing df.shape. We run this. So we can see here now that our data frame has 112,925 rows. So we've dropped around 29,000 rows of data. So for our next step, we're going to scale all of our numerical data. So scaling our data essentially means that we put all of our data here, or all of our numerical data onto the same scale. So usually with a mean zero and a unit variance. And the reason why we do this is often algorithms perform slightly better when our data is all put on the same scale. So first we need to create a list of columns that only contain the columns which are numerical. So remember that we have a mixture of both categorical and numerical columns. So one way just to check the data types of each of our column is by doing df.dtypes. And if we run this, we can see here. So object refers to columns that are categorical and float64 for columns that are numerical. So we want to create a list that just picks out all of these numerical columns, and then we will apply our scaling to each of these numerical columns. So first, we import the preprocessing function from the sklearn library to scale our data. And next, we're going to create a list that just contain all of our numerical data. So we'll call this list numerical. So we're going to do var for var in df.columns. And now we only want to add it to our list if the variable is numerical. So we do if df then var dot d type is equal to float 64. So now if we display this list, it should only give us the columns which are numerical. So there we go. So these are all of our numerical columns. So now we want to loop over all of our numerical columns and apply our scaling. So we'll do for col in numerical, then we do df col preprocessing dot scale, and then df col again. Put these in two brackets. And then we'll just display the head to make sure that everything is scaled. So let's run this. So we can see here now that if we compare it to our original data, so we can see here minimum temperature was sort of 13.4, 7.4. So we can see here now that they're all on the same scale and it will take somewhat similar values. Next, we're going to remove any outliers within our data since outliers can significantly damage the performance of our model. Because we've already scaled all of our data, it's much easier to identify and remove these outliers. So we've essentially put all of our data onto a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation of one. And one thing to note is 99.7% of data lies within three standard deviations of the column mean. So all of our column means are zero. This essentially means that 99.7% of the data within that column should be less than three or bigger than minus three. So the way that we're going to identify any outlier is to find any value which is bigger than three or less than minus three and simply remove that entire row from our data set. So first what we're going to do is to convert all of our standardized data into positive values and we can do that by doing z equals np dot absolute. And then we'll do df dot underscore get underscore numeric underscore data. And then we'll just print z. Okay, so essentially what we've done here is we've converted all of our values into positive values. So for example, if you look at the second row here, this minus 0 0.841802 has become positive. And now we want to keep all of the values that are less than three. We're going to do df equals df, and then z less than three, dot all axes equals one. So first remember that axes equals to one means that we're going across the columns. So we're going across like this, and then we go into the second row, and then the third. And essentially what this code is doing is essentially checking that all of the values within the row is less than three. And if it is, then we keep that, and if not, then we remove it. So this will only return true if all of the values within that row is less than three and false otherwise. So essentially we're just removing all of the rows which contain a value bigger than three. So let's now display the shape of our new data frame by doing df.shape, just to see how many rows that we've removed. And if we run this, we have 107,868 rows, 
which is quite a bit less than what we had before. So now that we've dealt with all of our numerical data, we have scaled it and we have removed the outliers, we're now going to go on to deal with our categorical data. So the first thing I'm going to do is replace all the no's with zeros and yeses with ones. So here we have two columns, rain today and rain tomorrow, which either contain the value no or yes. And for that, I'm using the same code as we did in the previous episode. So one thing to note is for each of our categorical columns, we don't just have two options, yes or no, we actually have multiple. So for example, in wind gust direction, we have west, west and northwest, west, southwest, northeast, and so on and so forth. So one way in which we can deal with these sort of categorical columns is by something called one-hot encoding. So what one-hot encoding essentially does is it takes the categorical column and then finds all of the unique values and creates a separate column for them. So for example, we have red, blue, and green. So we create three columns, red, blue, and green. We then use ones and zeros to indicate where it is present in the color column. So for the red column, we have one and one for the first two rows. We also have one in the blue for the third row and then two ones in the green for the fourth and fifth rows. So first we identify which of our columns are categorical by creating a list, just as we did with the numerical list. And then we loop through all of our columns and add all of the variables which are of type object. So let's now just print this list to make sure that it's all working. If we run this, so we can see here all of our categorical columns. We have already dealt with the rain today and rain tomorrow, and now we're going to apply one hot encoding for these four columns here. So here I've created a new list called categorical columns, where we're just going to be selecting the four columns in which we're going to apply one hot encoding. So let's now see all of the unique values in each of our categorical columns. So for that, we're going to do for col in categorical columns, and then we're going to do print np.unique and then df col. So if you run this, so we can see here that we have each of our locations and we also have all of our different wind directions. So we apply one hot encoding by using a function from the pandas library. So we do df equals pd.get underscore dummies. And then we identify our data frame, which is df. And then we select the columns in which we want to apply one hot encoding. So we do columns equals, and in this case, it's all of our categorical columns. And then we'll do df.head just to get an idea if it's worked or not. So if we run this, if we look at our columns, we have new columns created for each of our unique values. So for example, we now have a northwest column, a south column, and so on and so forth for each of our unique values. So now that we've finished manipulating all of our data, we're now going to split it into training and test groups. So for that, I've imported the train test split function from the scikit-learn library. So for this model, we're going to be using all of our variables apart from rain tomorrow as our input and rain tomorrow as our output. So to define our model's inputs, we can do capital X equals df.lock, which enables us to gain access to columns or labels by their name. We do colon, comma, df.columns, is not equal to rain tomorrow. We can then set our model's output by doing y equals df dot and then the name of our column, which is rain tomorrow. So you guys might be questioning how come we're including all of our variables apart from rain tomorrow as our input. Surely there might be some variables which don't have an effect of if it will rain tomorrow. And that's absolutely true. However, our model is able to actually figure out any variables which don't have an effect on our output and will assign a very small parameter value to this variable so it won't have a significant impact on the output of our model. So now that we've identified our inputs and output, we can split our data using the following code as we've done in the previous episode. So here we're using 75% as training data and 25% for testing. So now that we've split all of our data, we're ready to implement our model. So for that, I've imported the logistic regression function again from the scikit-learn library. So I'm just going to give this function a name. So we'll call it log reg. We'll set that equal to logistic regression. And then we fit our training data to our model. So we'll do log reg dot fit, and then x train, y train. So now I'm just going to run this cell to make sure our model is working. And there we go. So we've successfully fitted our logistic regression model to our training data. And now it's time to evaluate our model.
So in this episode, we're going to be using k-fold cross-validation to evaluate our model. If you guys aren't sure of what that is, I highly recommend checking out my previous video of cross-validation explained. So for k-fold cross-validation, I've imported a few functions, again from the scikit-learn library, so those being k-fold and cross-val score. And also we've imported mean from NumPy. So with k-fold cross-validation, the first thing we need to do is to split our data into k-folds. So we can do that by defining a variable. So we'll call this CV for cross-validation. And we set that equal to k-fold. So we're calling the k-fold function. We then define a number of splits. So we do n underscore splits. And let's do 10 splits. And we'll also give our data a shuffle to prevent any bias problems. So we'll set random state equals to one to make sure that we're using the same shuffling algorithm every time. And then we set shuffle equals to true. We're now going to use our cross val score to implement cross validation. So for that, we're going to create a list. We'll call it scores and we'll set it equal to cross val score. And this function takes a few arguments. So first the model, which we define as log reg. Also our model's inputs, which we define as X and our output Y and also what we're going to be scoring it based on. So we're going to be using the accuracy metric. So we'll do scoring equals accuracy. And lastly, we set the cross validation equal to our K fold. So we do CV equals CV, which is the variable we've defined here. We're then going to average the scores for each of our folds. So we're going to do average underscore score equals and then mean scores. And lastly, let's display this average score on our notebook. So we'll do print then overall score, comma, average score. And now if you run this, it may take some time considering k-fold cross validation tends to be quite expensive, but usually yields more accurate results. And there we go. Our overall accuracy is around 85.7%. So this is a reasonably good accuracy score, so we can now go on to use our model to make some predictions. So because we've done quite a bit of pre-processing in this episode, it will take quite some time to put any inputs into our model because we would have to scale the data and then apply one-hot encoding. So I'm going to be a bit lazy here and I'm just going to use some of our test data for our model to make some predictions on. So our test data has already been all pre-processed because when we did all of these pre-processing steps, we did it on the whole data set. So to make some predictions, we're going to do log reg dot predict. And then we're going to do x underscore test. And let's make some predictions for the first 50 observations. So if you run this cell now, there we go. So here are all of our predicted values for 50 observations from our test data. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this episode and have learned something new. In the next episode, I hope to be going over a completely new classification algorithm, which I hope you guys will enjoy. Thanks again guys for watching and if you have any questions please leave them in the comments below.